Hi, Black Carnivores. I am really excited to bring you today's interview with Cherie. Now, Cherie is, um, I, well, she does solo female van life. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but there is like a whole movement of people that, you know, outfitted their vans and they um, packed up, you know, their whole lives, fit it in the vans and they hit the road and they just live on the road 24-7 all the time and you know travel around in their vans and uh, it is a super popular thing and um, if you go on YouTube at all like there's a million videos about van life so uh, one of our own a member of the black carnivore community is also doing van life and uh, and combining that with the carnivore diet and I have been wanting to interview her for the longest time, um, but we were just trying to figure out how to make it work. So um, today's video is gonna be a little bit different because um, you know we I wanna make sure that she is safe on the road. You know, she is a single black female on the road uh, in America in these, um, in these times. So we did not record um, video and we did not talk about specifically where she is. But um, I still think that the conversation was absolutely, uh, you know, it's fantastic and totally interesting. So I encourage you to listen in, but um, there will be no more audio. I'm sorry, there will be no more video after, um, after this portion. And uh, I also wanted to let you know that she started an apparel company and uh, is selling, you know, t-shirts, leggings, and so on that promote a meat-based diet. So I encourage you to check that out so you can support her and, and um, help her to, you know, stay on the road. And, um, and she also has an interesting Instagram where she shows, um, you know, really beautiful photographs and video of places that she's been around the country. So uh, I'll have all of that, those links in the um, description box below and um, let's dive right into it. I'm sure you're gonna enjoy this. Oh, and our conversation was super, super long, so I broke it into two and uh, this is part one and then next week we're gonna do part two. Okay. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Black Carnivore podcast and I am really excited to introduce today's guest, Cherie. So if you notice, we are doing an audio only and um, that is because uh, Cherie has a really interesting lifestyle and, um, and uh, we, I just want to dig into it today. In addition to being carnivore, she does a uh, solo female van life. So, you know, she's out there and exploring the country and, uh, you know, just sort of living in her van. And I, I think a lot of us are fascinated by the lifestyle. So um, I'm really excited to get to hear from her her all about what it's like, how she got there. And, you know, eventually like, how does carnivore fit into that? How does that work? So, uh, yeah, let's, let's dive right in. So Cherie is, did I say that right? Or did yes. I say that wrong? No, Cherie. that's right. Okay. <laughs> okay. So Cherie, tell us, you know, tell, tell me how you got started. Where did this idea come from? How did you like go into van life? Well, I basically wanted to um, get on the road because I really like driving and I like being on the road. That's kind of just been my spirit. I've just kind of fought it my whole life, even though I moved. Once I was able to move out of my mom's house and stuff and go to college, I was moving like every six months. So there was something about me that was nomadic anyway. And um, how I ended up in van life uh, is I was going to do this, but then I decided to move out of the country instead. And so I moved to Ecuador and I lived there for about three years and I was offered a job uh, in the United States at the job that I was working before I moved to Ecuador. And it was kind of one of those offer things that I couldn't resist. <laughs> so um, it, as far as like compensation, and everything. So I decided to move back. I had to be in the U.S. to take it. So I had to move back to the U.S. And I didn't want to get an apartment. I didn't want to reestablish myself in the U.S. I really didn't because I felt like I was going to travel. I was going to move outside of the country again. And once I moved outside of the country the first time, I knew that I was going to probably do it again. So um, I decided to house it instead. And so I house sat for a year when I moved back and I worked that job remotely. And when you house sit in between house sits, you have to pay for a hotel or something. And so I was spending a lot of money um, in between house sits 
just on, you know, like accommodations. And so I decided that it made sense for me to just buy a van. And in between house sits, I could just live in the van instead. And also I could use that van to get from house sit to house sit instead of paying for flights, which was also costing me a lot of money. So that's exactly how I got into van life is I was like, it makes sense just buy a van, live in it um, in between house sits. But then once I got the van, I didn't want to go. <laughs> I didn't want to go to anybody's house. <laughs> so uh, that was it. I stayed in the van and I didn't do house sitting anymore. Wow, that is so interesting. Um, so, well, I, so I have a bunch of questions. Um, one, when you left Ecuador, did you leave with the idea that you were going to go back or did you like, you know, get rid of your apartment and all your stuff there and come back permanently? Well, I got rid of everything um, and came back kind of semi-permanently because the thing is with Ecuador, I had a, um, a permanent residence visa. So I could have just gone back. Uh, there's, a, there's a time period where you'll eventually lose it, but it's not difficult to get another one. Um, so the idea of going back to Ecuador is still in my mind, but for maybe retirement, because it's really one of those places you want to retire to, um, because it's very slow paced. There's not much going on. Um, uh, on some level, there was a, a little bit of boredom there just because li literally there was nothing going on. It's the most tranquil place like I've ever been. And <laughs> I, I was like, well, if you got a little life left in you, you, <laughs> you, you know, Ecuador <laughs> might be a little bit too, <laughs> a little bit too slow. So, but for retirement, it, it would be completely ideal, which is what most of the expats are doing there is they, they've retired. Um, so when I moved back, I, I just thought that I was going to go to a different place because a lot, there was, there was a group of black people there that I met expats from the States who, um, you know, everybody had their own reason for going there and, and, and enjoying life there. But then, you know, we're all kind of young. We weren't retirement age. And so like everybody kind of went there. It wasn't me that just moved back. Everybody else kind of went everywhere. Like I had other friends there who went to Columbia one moved to Belize and I still keep in touch with them but it was just one of those things where I knew I was going to go someplace else I was just coming back to um work this job <laughs> and like save the money and then like go someplace else mm -hmm. um so that was really the plan was to come back you know save all do house sitting save all that money while I was house sitting and then just go to a different country I just wasn't sure which which country I was going to move to but then van life happened and it's it's so much fun that I'm just not there yet for moving back out of, the, out of the country. So how did you know about it? I mean, even if I were coming back from Ecuador and feeling like I didn't want to, you know, reestablish like a, you know, a home base or something, I don't know that I would, it would just have occurred to me or were you familiar with this lifestyle even before? I was familiar with it before. I was uh, pretty obsessed with it beforehand. I was going to buy this 40 foot school bus and just, you know, fix it up and, um, you know, into a home and then just kind of travel the country with it. And I kind of just really was focused on it for a very long time, like a number of years, at least five years. But when the, when the time came um, where I was just really wanting to do something different, I just wanted to get out of the country at that point. Mm -hmm. I was, I was like, I uh, forget that bus. <laughs> and I just, <laughs> I, I'd like to just leave the country. And I did it. I didn't even, I didn't even second guess it. I just made it happen. And then I left. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. That's so awesome. And I do understand, you know, that, uh, that desire to go. I, um, when I was working on my PhD in anthropology, I decided to go to, uh, um, well, the Netherlands to do research for my dissertation. And I knew that I wanted to live abroad. So I knew that I was going to go there and I knew that I was going to stay for a while. And I ended up staying three years. And uh, I think, you know, it's fa fabulous to live outside of the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. It really, you know, it really allows you to understand another perspective and uh that is so important <laughs> to yes. really understanding the world yes i totally agree i it, it was really freeing in so many different ways and also just 
that it's possible. It, it wasn't even difficult to do once you get there and you learn the culture, you learn what it is that, uh, how things work as far as like utilities, apartments and, and um, just basic living. Um, it, was, it was quite easy. And I think that sometimes um, that's scary beforehand. So it's hard to think about moving to another country. How am I gonna survive? How am I gonna get an apartment? How am I gonna live? And getting over that hump, then I, you know, once I lived there, I felt like I can, I feel like I can live anywhere now. Mm -hmm. So what were, um, you know, what were some of the biggest differences that you saw between Ecuador and the U.S.? Like, I don't know what the culture is like there. So what were, what were some of the biggest differences that you, well, the things that you liked and the things that you didn't like? (laughs) Well, (laughs) the biggest differences was really people's attitudes. Um, Everything was very tranquil. That was like a common thing people say there is, you know, muy tranquilo, because that's, that's, that is the atmosphere. Nothing is in a rush. And there's no reason for you to get an attitude because they don't care. (laughs) Like they don't know, (laughs) you know, it's really like that, but it's not, they they don't argue. Like if you were going to, you know how here sometimes people get heated, even in a grocery store or something like that, and they'll get loud and stuff. They just don't do it. Uh, They don't do that. And so that's kind of a different thing. Uh, If you're a very anxious person, uh, you, you, uh, might not want to be there because like, it's, it'll force you to calm down, to become a calm person and to not expect things to happen. Like on the second that you think it's going to happen. Uh, so that was, that was a huge difference because it's just, um, it's very, it's just a very different atmosphere. You, you kind of have to change your, your mindset and the work ethic is very different too. Um, if like, for, for example, during lunchtime, all the shops, every business shuts down for at least two hours because they go home and they eat with their family. And that's important. So you can't be like, oh, well, they're not open because, you know, it's lunchtime or whatever. And it's two hours. Well, that's that's how they do. Um, They would rather be at home with their families than at that job. And it's not that they don't care about the job. It's just that their families are extremely important. Um, So everything, and I say that in general, everything revolves around the family unit there. For example, it's a little bit difficult to find like a a one bedroom apartment. You can find one, but it's it's very rare. I mean, it's not common because most people stay with their parents. They stay with their family. So even if they get married, they just, you know, they they have, you know, a, a bigger place and everybody has their own room and stuff like that. But it's just more of a, you know, family centered, place and um it's just very different the food is very different um the quality of the food is a thousand times better than here Um, really i i lost probably i would say 70 pounds without doing without doing anything i was actually eating pure trash when i was there like what we would what we, we would consider like trash as far as junk food and all that kind of stuff um, I was eating all of that there and, um, but they, they make their food local, like for instance, chocolate bars and stuff. It's local. It's, it's like, uh, within the source, the chocolate and everything and ingredients within the country. Uh, whereas like, I wouldn't buy like a Snickers bar because it was like $6 <laughs> and I was mm-hmm. not that dedicated to Snickers. So, um, so I would not buy the Snickers bar, but then I'd buy one that was produced uh, like a candy bar that was produced in Ecuador. And I, I, you know, so I didn't, I really wasn't doing the carnivore thing then. And I wasn't um, really watching what I ate at all. And I still lost a lot of weight. I just feel like the quality of the food is just a lot less and I mean, a lot better. And um, I just found that that was, I didn't expect that at all. Um, and things like fluoride and things like that, they don't put it in the water, they put it in the salt. So you have a choice of whether or not mm-hmm. you want to ingest something like that. Um, so I'm sorry, I was just a little bit distracted because somebody drove by and they were pointing and, and carrying on. So, <laughs> so you have to kind of oh. deal with that sometimes while you're on the road. Well, I want to hear more about that too, but um, yeah, but yeah. um, So the quality of the food was um, very great because like uh, 
if you look at the neighborhood that I was in, I lived in just a typical Ecuadorian neighborhood and everybody had a garden in their backyard, every single person. Um, they had chickens running around the neighborhood. They had pigs in, in their yard. Um, they had all, you know, different types of uh, like rabbits and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, just the average family took care of their own meals for the most part, even though they had regular grocery stores and they had a big open market that I used to go to where you could get um, meats and veggies and all that kind of stuff uh, that was organic or not organic, uh, whatever you wanted to get. But still people had to um, basically, if you know, raise their own food. And so I just saw that like on a daily basis, the, the whole neighborhood, that's how it was. Um, and also there was a farm where you could order for them directly and it was all organic and they would deliver it to you. So I was constantly just ordering from them and they would just bring it what, like whatever you want and it would still have the dirt on it. They would just pick it that morning and bring it to you. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was fantastic. It was just, so that uh, sounds idyllic. Yeah, it was very, um, there was there was I could go on and on to be honest <laughs> like I really could because there's so um so many differences um even to be honest their cell their cell phone service and their internet service was better than I experienced here in the states um really so, yeah it wow. was I had like fiber optic internet in my apartment and it was like 20 bucks a month I mean it was it was a uh, it was crazy like just and I'm talking in the cities, though. Now, if you go out into the rural areas, then you on your own. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's different as far as infrastructure. But in the cities, like the bigger cities, like where I was, um, you know, the infrastructure was really good. Uh, so you could, yeah. yeah, I taught English online, so I really needed to have a good internet connection. And so uh, they had it. Um, That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, um, as far as the bad stuff, the only really big complaint that I have, like there's two big complaints that I have about Ecuador. One is if you live in a city, which a lot of times if you need that infrastructure, if you need that really good internet service, you have to live in one of the cities. There's no other option. Uh, you know, even though if you live in some of the smaller towns and stuff like that, they're way nicer. I mean, they're nice in terms of just relaxation. Mm -hmm. The th other thing about living in the bigger cities is the noise. And like, um, it's next level. It's not like regular, like you think of New York City that how it might be seem like really loud to, to people um, or any of the bigger cities, LA or whatever. Um, there's, there's typical city noise. It's beyond that. It's, it's beyond What's making that. all this noise? Everything, like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you know, people say that Ecuador's national anthem is car alarms because it's that bad, <laughs> it is okay. that bad, um, just car alarms, no reason, I mean, just going off all, all times of day and night, and um, parties, when they say they party to the break of dawn, we say that here in the States, they actually mean it in, in, in Ecuador, and uh, parties that are loud, it doesn't matter if they're a couple blocks away, or what have you, they are extremely, extremely loud, that so I, it sounds slow paced, but not, right. you know, not at a standstill, like you can not, still find a good time. Yeah. yeah, you can find a good time. I mean, if you, if you want to roll those dice, <laughs> if you want to <laughs> roll the dice, I mean, you can find, there's definitely a party scene. If you want to um, do, you know, clubs and stuff, they do have that. If you are interested in that, I, I'm, I'm older now. I don't really get into that. So it was, um, to me, right. it seems like there's there was not a whole lot to do unless you want to travel to the, all the different countries that are around Ecuador and right. uh, just, just to visit. But uh, the noise level, yeah, I mean, so there's the loud music, even the announcements at the schools that they do for the students are super mm -hmm. loud. Like everything is loud. And then like things on like, like Mother's Day where men come out at night and they come out like, you know, between like midnight and like four or 5 a.m. to serenade their mothers in the streets. <laughs> and, wow and, that's kind of cool it is cool however you know how when you go to a party or some type of event and they have those gigantic speakers those mm -hmm. PA type speakers they haul those things around and that's what they're singing into so it's not like <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's not 
not like they're singing to their mothers, you know, just right at, you know, face to face or whatever, just using their voice. They right. they got they got the PA speakers out. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. So well, <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like you had a good time in Ecuador, but, um, yeah, yeah. you know, you were interested in a, a different experience here. So um, how did you, so you got back and you did house sitting for a year. How did you get into that? You know, I listened to that, that, oh God, who is that woman on YouTube? Um, I don't hear you talking about, but I can't remember her name. Oh my God. I was just watching her this morning. I can't believe I can't remember her name. Well, anyway, she has the house sitter school. It, so I assume um, that's not the way you got Stephanie Perry. That's her name. Oh, yes. But, Mm-hmm. I assume that's not the way you got into it or how did you figure out, you know, how to do this house sitting thing? No, what I, what I just basically did was I Googled house sitting and I picked, um, house sitters America as a platform to start with. Um, I don't think, I think I just picked it because it was cheaper because, um, the other one that's like the big, the really huge one, I can't remember the name of it. Um, maybe it's, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but there's one that's like the biggest one that they have. It was extremely expensive um, to join, but I I just went with House Sitters America, and I just it really was not difficult. I with I think in less than two weeks I was able to get my first house sitting gig. Oh wow! Okay, and, and um, so that's literally how I started. So from what from there, if a person gives you like a good review then you can leverage that to start getting other houses. And I just find like, particularly with my, my profile, I made it extremely detailed. Mm-hmm. And, I, and uh, some people, some people might not like it, but a, a lot of people told me that they really appreciated it because then they would know exactly what I was willing to do, what to expect, mm-hmm. like what I was willing to do and um, you know, what I wasn't willing to do and that kind of thing. So I felt like that was helpful in the end, like just the way that I worded my letters when I would reply to people's uh, house sitting opportunities, Um, basically just all the benefits that they would get out of it, basically. So was it, so when you said you house sat for a year, that wasn't one house sitting, you, you just did it for a year and you kind of went from place to place. Correct. Uh Uh-huh. And, um, and in between house sets. So that's what you were saying in the beginning, like you have to figure out where you're going to be and what to do between house sets. And that can, that can get expensive. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, um, so you decided to revisit this old dream of doing van life. Um, so did you build out the van yourself? Where did you do it? Um, I mean, like, did you go home to somebody's driveway or, you know, (laughs) did you buy it all done? Like, you know, how did that happen? Okay. So what I did was I'm a very different person in a lot of ways. And uh, I kind of have to kind of take a little side trip to back to Ecuador. I had an apartment. I never had furniture. Like, um, (laughs) I had um, uh, the first apartment I had had no furniture in it. You can buy, you can rent them furnished, but I never did. And then the second one that I had that I was in the longest, I had a desk and a chair and a bed and that was it. But that's how I like to live. So let's fast forward to when I bought the van. I just bought a Chevy Astro van. It was a passenger van. It had two bench seats in the back and I took everything. I took the bench seats out And I took up the carpet and I cleaned the thing uh, totally inside and out. I took all the wall panels off because I kind of wanted to see what I was going to have to work with, like what what I could do with the interior. But at the same time, too, I didn't want to. I didn't really want to take off. I didn't want to just, you know, remove the interior, like what was built in the van, just because it's um, already kind of. made for it so I didn't I didn't want to do too much Um, so I did take all of that stuff out and I literally hit the road with nothing but a toolkit and a rug in the back like an area rug in the back of the van it was completely empty and well uh, so wow um it's stunned so (laughs) I mean how does that work? Cause like there, are, you know, the last couple of months I have gotten 
deeply into watching these van life videos and watching people build them out. And um, some of them are just so impressive, the um, creativity or ingenuity that went into designing the space. But it does seem like there are some basic, basic things that you kind of need when you're on the road. So, you know, how did that work for you? Like, I mean, I guess I can imagine with like showering and going to the bathroom, you know, you get a planet fitness thing and then, you know, you kind of go from one gym to the next and you can take care of your needs like that. But like, you know, eating water, like getting some work done, like how did you do that before, you know, you got the space kind of really comfortable? What did you sleep on? Well, um, what I, I just slept for a little while these this is a short period of time I slept on the floor I just um went and got like a sleeping bag and I slept on the floor so when I so when I bought the van I was at a house sit and when I say I left with nothing but the area rug and the tools that was pretty much it because that was like my last house sit um at least for a long time um <clears throat> so that's all I had but eventually I had to get like a um you know, like a bedding, basically, like a blanket and a sleeping bag and a pillow. Um, then I, I got a, a hammock and I was sleeping in a hammock for a long time um, in here. I just strung it from one end to Wait. the other. Okay. So you, you strung a hammock. Is So um, I've seen hammocks for, you know, hanging out and stuff, but um, mm -hmm. this is like nightly, like Gilligan's Island, the <laughs> captain and Gilligan sleeping in hammocks. That's how it was. Yes. Okay. In the, inside the van, not outside. Okay. And w uh, was it cold at that point or was it summertime and you didn't have to worry about heat? And stuff? It it was not cold at that point. Um, it's, it's a transition now. I, it's, a, it's a transition and it's just kind of funny thinking about it now. But um, it was not uh, cold at that point. It was starting to get cold. So I had the hammock. Um, I had some stuff for my clothes. Like I had like little bins for my, for my clothes. And so I was buying things as I went. And a lot of people do that as well. Like they'll just do basic like how can I sleep in the vehicle and then they'll start kind of building it out as they're on the road I knew that I was not going to do a, a build like a, like you see on YouTube I was not going to do all that stuff that people were going to do because I'm out here um, the way that I live out here is more on the adventure side and um, I kind of feel like if you've ever been <laughs> down a service road or a forest road um, you'll know that a lot of that stuff is going to get torn up uh, it, at some point uh, because they're, the roads are so bad that like, say you built a cabinet, you, everything's all beautiful. You got your little sprinter van or whatever. Everything's all beautiful. You got to, even though you have things to keep the cabinets from opening and all that, eventually that's a lot of wear and tear on the interior of all that stuff that you put in there. All of that shock that you're getting from these roads. Like for instance, like my camping area today is actually 30 minutes down the road, but I just couldn't take it. I was like, I'm not doing, I'm not driving. I, I could <laughs> and say so if I have to do 30 more minutes, which really is an hour, because there's no way I can drive any type of decent speeds. I'm going to have to endure this, this terrible road. And I was not willing to do it. So uh, when you build that kind of stuff, unless you're going to be staying in a lot of campgrounds that have, you know, nicer roads and things like that, which I think a lot of people do when they have the, um, you know, fancier rigs and whatnot, um, it's going to be tough. It's going to get a, like a lot of wear and tear. There's no reason not to do it, but I'm just saying like, I just decided I wasn't going to do that because I just felt like my experience was going to be more like an overlander experience than necessarily your typical van life experience. So how do you know, I guess, like what type of van lifer you're going to be? I mean, you know, when I imagine doing it, I don't know. I, I mean, I imagine like being in somewhere um, in nature with a beautiful vista, but I don't know, you know, I'm not necessarily thinking about whether I'm on, what is it, Bureau of Land Management land that's, mm -hmm. you know, just free and open, or if I'm at a fancier campground, um, you know, so how do you know? How do you know what to expect? Um, you really don't know until you, well, for me personally, I didn't really know until I got out here. Well, I kind of had an idea that I'm, I wanted to be more like a, um, 
somebody who just kind of goes off road because I'm very curious like I, sometimes I could be very tired and I'm driving and I want to but I can't stop because I want to know what's around the corner like like I was like okay I was like maybe you should turn around right now but I'm like no what's what's around the corner then like I, I feel like and sometimes I've been pleasantly surprised when I've gone around the corner and there's something beautiful and magical there so um that's what I, I'm very uh, exploratory in that way. Like I, and so that kind of dictates what type of van life I became because um, if you just want to, like you said, oh, I'm going to go to this place because I heard it's beautiful. It has a beautiful lake and that beautiful views, which, you know, I know a lot of people that do that. Then you go from that place to that place and you're just more of a, um, almost, uh, you're taking almost a tour of these different places and you're living at the same time um, it just depends on what you end up liking, like if you want, or you can do a mix of it. There's just really no set, you know, uh, expectation of what kind of life you're going to live out here. It's just um, very, very different, very free, and then you are changing over time as well, because there are places that I would never have gone the first year I was out. Now, I just don't care about, I just don't care, but, <laughs> but before, there is there's definitely a lot of places and a lot of roads that I was like, oh, I don't think I can do that. Now I'm like, oh, that's nothing. Interesting. Well, what um so uh so how is your like rig or your outfit like now versus then? Do you have more creature comforts or do you still keep it very spare? And, you know, I assume like if you're doing remote work, like you need to have at least power and perhaps a desk <laughs> or some place to work. How does that work? Right. Okay. So um, eventually what happened is I started living in the van before I actually officially stopped house sitting. So the very last house that I did, I ordered a bunch of stuff. And it was very important, like if I was to tell people to start, it, when they start out, these are the things that I, I basically started with. And I'm glad that I did. And the first, uh, what I bought was a freezer. And I bought a battery and I bought solar panels. And um, I also bought two uh, really, well, they're five gallon uh, water containers or jerry cans. And um, also a fan uh, for the roof. So you have to cut a hole in the roof and install the fan. One of those like ones that uh, kind of moves air around. There, it's called a fantastic fan. It's very common out here. Did you do uh, that yourself? I did in the desert. <laughs> Wow. I, I installed Cut a hole in the roof. Good job. <laughs> yep. I installed uh, all the solar panels on the roof out in the desert. And at the same time that I installed the, the fan and um, I built a, a battery box um, for the battery. I got the fuse panel, the charge controller. I got everything that I needed at that one house sit so that I could um, hit the road and actually put all that stuff together. So I, I've had power for 99% of the time that I've been on the road. And I've had the freezer so that I could keep food in it. And then I had the can so that I could have the water um, that I need. Because um, water is very easy to find on the road. So that's never really an issue or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, so let's, let's actually um, turn to food. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I'm curious about, uh, well, not only how you do carnivore and you, you started by talking about the freezer, but also, you know, sort of how does your eating style fit in with the rest of the community and, um, you know, do people like look at you askance or not? Um, but to go back, so I think the freezer is such a, you know, that's such an interesting thing because when I watch these van life videos and I kind of imagine you know, if I were to live like this, what I would do differently, like a freezer is the number one thing. Like mm -hmm. there's no need really for a refrigerator in our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And that would, you know, like free up so much storage space in the van. Um, but, you know, go ahead, tell me what you, you know, what your thoughts are and how, you know, how you eat every day. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I knew that I was going to, try to go hardcore with the carnivore and really change my health and my life with this so that's why I ended up getting the freezer you can use this as a refrigerator but I knew I was just going to use it as a freezer so um 
I basically knew too that I wanted to be able to go to farms while I'm on the road um, because really there's no reason for it. Uh, if I there's no reason for me not to when they're so accessible if I'm already on the road. Um, because it's hard if you live in a brick and, uh, you know, sticks and bricks, and you have to drive two hours or three hours or four hours to a farm to get your meat directly from a farm. But if I'm already on the road, then that's a lot easier for me. So that's been um, fantastic, because then I've found farms that um, may not be on the internet, or they might not be advertised anywhere. And yet they still, you know, serve the public, that you can go there and buy directly from them. Um, that I probably wouldn't have found if I was, you know, stationary someplace. And well, how big is the freezer? I mean, are you talking about buying like 10 pounds from them or because it seems like if you're buying like a quarter cow, like that's a lot of meat. Yeah, um, my freezer is a 54 quart and it's um, actually quite, quite roomy. Um, so, for example, there is a place in Utah that I like to get meats from and they sell boxes so like a uh, you know they'll have like different cuts of meat in this big box and I'm usually able to get all of that in the freezer and it's a lot and it'll last me at least like almost a month um, I can't you know the realistic thing is when you're on the road you're not going to be able to store you know a half a you know a half of a, a cow or you know, you, maybe a quarter of cow if you're in a bigger vehicle and you have a deep freezer, which is what I plan to do eventually. You could probably do a quarter of cow, but you couldn't do um, a half a cow or anything like that. But in this freezer, I could still do quite a bit of meat um, and have it last for a month. And then I'm also fishing. So when I go fish and I catch fish, then I have the fish plus what I bought from the farmer or a butcher. Wow, I didn't know you were also an outdoors woman. So you really, um, you like the outdoors. So you catch your own fish and your own dinner? Yes, I, I like the my first year, it is very exciting for me because I've, I, li I grew up in Florida. So I've always been um, a fisherman, so to speak. I've always, you know, been fishing, but deep sea fishing, which is quite different than fishing in lakes and, and creeks and stuff, which I, I had no idea. I really legit, when I hit the road last year, and I decided I was going to start catching my own fish that I had this giant shark pole. I mean, it was like I brought my pole from Florida, which was huge. It was like something you would take deep fishing. And I just it, it took me a minute when I went to go to some of these lakes and um, Utah and stuff. And I was like, everybody's got these little tiny little poles like <laughs> what's going on? So I had to spend all of last year basically learning how to fish lakes and creeks and streams and that kind of stuff which was part of the adventure for me like I really enjoyed that I really got into it um, learning all the different baits and stuff like that and um, towards the end of the year I, I totally was not catching anything I just couldn't figure it out and then towards the end of the year I started catching fish and I was so excited and then this year earlier this year when I was fishing in, in Utah a lot um, I was just catching fish left and right so it was pretty awesome. Wow, that is uh, so cool. Um, do you do you have a boat or do you just kind of hang on the, the pier or the shore and fish from there? I was doing basically doing shore fishing. Um, and if they there was a dock, I would I would uh, fish off the dock. Um, but definitely shore fishing. Um, eventually, I would like a fishing kayak because I just feel like I definitely missed out on a lot of different opportunities um, to fish because I didn't have a boat. I've definitely seen van life videos where they fit somehow fit a kayak. In, in yeah, the van. yeah, yeah. I definitely, I definitely don't have room because I don't have a full size van. I have a Chevy Astro, which is a middle size, technically a middle size van, and I don't have any room for one inside the van. I can't put it on the roof because my whole roof is uh, covered in solar panels. So uh, right. I'd have to uh, get a different rig, which I am looking for an ambulance. So um, eventually. Oh, yeah. I've seen some really cool ones in ambulances. So yeah. exciting. And so again, um, do you, 
I mean, would you do like the work itself? I mean, I assume you might, if you had an ambulance, you might put in a little bit more stuff. Like, would you do that yourself or are you handy like that? Yes, I'll do everything myself because one of my conditions for being out on this road is to be able to fix whatever the vehicle I'm in. Um, that's kind of one of the reasons why I scrapped getting the bus, even though buses are dirt cheap. I mean, I could get a 40 foot bus right now for like 3K or less. Um, so <clears throat> I said, if I'm going to get a vehicle, I need to be able to do the work on it. And that includes electrical work, um, mechanical work that kind of thing there are certain things of course I'll take to a mechanic but um, for the most part like everything on this van I fixed on the road if it broke down or I had to you know do maintenance or whatever so with the ambulance I would definitely do everything myself and also for the ambulance one of the reasons why I would buy that I prefer to buy one of those is because it already has cabinets and countertops um, so I would not destroy any of that. That would be kind of one of the reasons why I'd get it. So I'd keep all the counters, um, keep all the cabinets and, and they're built really well. So I think it would be for me personally foolish to even remove all that stuff. Um, so that's the plan. And also I don't plan to um, do anything internally to it as far as a build out per se, because like I said, I'm very different from a, from a lot of people. I really don't like all of that. Like I don't, I like uh, empty almost. So, and I like to keep it stock. Like when you go in it, it's gonna look like an ambulance. Like, <laughs> and I'm sure it's gonna, it's gonna have my little personal tr touches, but for the most part, it's gonna look like an ambulance instead of it. Um, uh, just because I'm just not uh, focused on, the aesthetics part of uh, built, being in a, a vehicle. Like I'm out here to kind of adventure, go to all these different places, um, get more sports equipment. Like I can fit, I, I'm just excited for the ambulance because there's all those cabinets on the outside of it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I could probably get one of those inflatable kayaks to put it in and carry it and have the room for it. I can get targets for my archery. I can do all this stuff. That's how I think of it. I'm not really thinking about the fan, the part of uh, what it looks like on the inside, because I'm I'm pretty much going to throw up another hammock, <laughs> as far as like, you know, the sleeping arrangements and everything like that, and um, I'm kind of no frills, I guess that's what I'm saying. <laughs> wow. Okay. Cool. And um, so you said you do archery as well. Is that for hunting or just um, for fun or potentially future hunting? It's for future hunting. I just recently bought some recurve bows and the whole goal is I'm going to be part, um, you know, practicing and things and, and learning it um, just because I do think it's fun. I remember doing it when I was younger and it was fun and it's something that I always wanted to do. But also I'm very prepared to do uh, use it for hunting, which is actually what I um, going to be a part of because once uh, once you're on the road you kind of decide how you're going to live too so like for me the future includes me hunting for my food as well fishing and hunting and trying to um, actually get the meat that I need um, on my own other than maybe if I want some beef or something like that I can go to a farm and get it um, but other things like game meats I can if I can get that myself I definitely want to do that Tell me more about how you learned about carnivore and why you felt like that was something that was good for you. Well, um, there's two things. Um, one is that I'm a, I'm actually a natural carnivore and I knew it, but I was trying so hard to do what I was being told to do. Um, the other thing is that eventually it all came back to like with my health issues and um, just the way that I naturally eat. I just got tired of fighting my natural instincts. And um, so eventually I just had to look into it, uh, figure out, you know, what it is that was going to actually make me healthy. And I started reading about just different ways of eating in general, just more broad about it, not just looking at one um, different aspect, the low fat aspect which I was focusing on before and then that's when I found like that was when the Atkins diet was like just coming out and just becoming popular and so from there it was just that kinda, back in the 90s or yeah yeah it was back yeah. in the 90s back in the day 
Um, it was just coming out and yeah, so that was the fourth um, iteration of the Atkins book, and mm-hmm. it did have a big, um, a big splash. And like I, re- I remember, everybody was kind of like doing it or trying it. Right, right. And that's that's how I started with trying to understand nutrition. Like before that, it was just kind of um, blindly trying to figure out what's going on with me health wise. Whereas, um, you know, once I started to have a, a kind of, some kind of understanding of how nutrition works uh, with your health and, and contributes to your health, then everything started kind of going in that direction for me learning wise. And I kind of went back and forth between Atkins and falling off the wagon and that kind of thing, like just for a long time and trying to do going back to low fat diets and then coming back to no, I can't do this low fat thing. And I can't. keep. Why, why did you waffle? Like what was the falling off the wagon about? And, and yeah, what was the waffling about? So the waffling was basically when you're trying to eat a low fat diet, you're hungry all the time. Like, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't connect the dots then on what was causing me to fall off the wagon was just, if you're um, eating things that are being digested too quickly or causing you IBS um, symptoms, so you're, they're really running through your body, you're, they're, you're not even really digesting them, which is what I was experiencing. I was just constantly hungry. And so I would find myself on a, on a low fat diet eating crap because it was like, oh, I'm still hungry. I'm, I'm trying to eat right but this eating so-called eating right is not keeping me full is it's making my cravings very strong for things like sugar and carbohydrates and um at the time i just didn't recognize it as such so i just kept going back and forth with it okay and so um and during that time like well, I don't know. I was assuming, did your weight like start going up as you do these different diet efforts and, you know, um, my weight slowly kind of went up, but when I look back on it, especially when I look at pictures when I was younger in my twenties and stuff like that, my weight was actually consistent. Um, I just was, wasn't, um, very healthy. Like I was tired all the time, like excessively tired, brain fog um, all the time. Um, I just was not able to be very productive. And uh, I was depressed, like seriously depressed. Like my mood was an issue, like a huge issue. Um, Just constantly just not being able to regulate my emotions and stuff like that. Um, So yeah, I I just, I had a lot of that. Um, And then it wasn't until I got older where my weight was just sky starting to skyrocket, like really Mm -hmm. started to skyrocket on top of all that other stuff. Right. So what are your goals now? Why, uh, you know, why are you doing the carnivore diet? So now um, my goals are to kind of regain my, regain some type of health because like, um, it's not like I'm about half dead, but I, I just feel like there have been times where I felt like I was on my way out. Um, I, you know, had issues with my gallbladder. I have autoimmune diseases, things like that. Um, I got a strange allergy that if I like walk at any short distance or any distance at all, or even any type of vibrational, uh, you know, any type of vibration, like even going down a, a very bumpy road, my skin itches, like my legs will itch. And it itches Mm -hmm. to the point where it's debilitating. Like if I were to walk, you know, say you say, oh, let's go for a hike. And 10, 15 minutes into the hike, my legs are itching so bad that we have to stop where I feel like I'm going to have like uh, uh, a breakdown. Like, (laughs) so that's, that's kind of a strange allergy that did not develop until after I was out of high school. And then like the more I think about the progression of it and the fact that that happened to my sister as well and my mother as well, and we all have digestive issues, um, it just occurred to me that that was related, diet related as well. So like if, for instance, if we're going to go on a hike, I would have to take something like Zyrtec before we go. I'd have to take an allergy medication 
for that not to happen. Wow. So, so do you feel like that, that kind of stuff went away as you did carnivore or improved? It does improve. Um, I think it's going to eventually go away, but I think it's going to take a, a little bit longer than it's going to take a, a longer time um, to fix it. Cause I think it's just really gut related. And I noticed that if I were to have anything with gluten in it, like, you know, right now that allergy would magnify like instantly, like how, you know, it, I would notice the difference like quickly. Um, so I just, um, I just really, it's important to me for, uh, to fix that, um, to fix the, uh, autoimmune stuff to fix. I got hormonal issues, um, as well. I was able to fix a lot of hormonal stuff by increasing my iodine intake. Um, actually mm -hmm. it was very life-changing for me. I can't even really explain it, but it was, it was actually life-changing because that depressive, um, state that I was in when I was younger completely mm -hmm. went away and it has not returned at all. Um, so it was a, a by adding iodine to a carnivore diet or just in general, you're saying adding iodine just in general. And, um, but before I was doing the carnivore diet and I had to add the iodine, I had to take it in very high dosages, um, as a supplement, whereas doing the carnivore diet, I can get my iodine from the food instead of doing that. So it's still a been, you know, a huge benefit, uh, to do the carnivore way. Wait, what are some of the foods that you get iodine from? Like liver is, is uh -huh. a big one. Okay. And I do eat a lot of liver. I like it. I like pate a lot. Gotcha. Uh, I actually didn't even realize that's where you get iodine from. I was imagining, you know, foods from the sea. Um, oh, that too. Yeah, definitely. Um, a lot of seafood as well uh, is, is definitely for that. Because at one point I was taking kelp pills that were helpful too mm -hmm. for that. Yeah. Okay. But, yeah. So, um, so, so I, now, uh, -huh, go ahead. Oh, uh, we were talking about just general goals. I don't think I finished that thought on the goals. So the, so the goals were just that I really would like to, um, really eliminate all of these diet related health issues that I have. And also to, um, and, and I have polycystic ovarian disease, um, so I would like to totally get that into remission because it's been something I've suffered with, you know, for a very long time. So I'd like to get that completely into remission and um, uh, just be, feel, you know, better physically. That's really my goal because I think everything else is secondary. Everything else will fall into place once I have that uh, taken care of. Yeah, absolutely. So how long have you been doing uh, carnivore consistently and, and are you seeing steady improvement or, you know, what, what does that look like for somebody who might be listening to you and considering this way of eating? <laughs> so um, when I've done, I've been doing consistently for, I would say maybe a year, I would say solid. I, this is one of those periods where I wasn't doing it like I'd done it. I had done it years before, like maybe from 2010 to 2015, something like that. And um, it was in between that time period. That's probably the longest stretch that I had done it. And I saw some improvements in uh, my sleep and also um, just my overall health, especially my gallbladder that issue uh, kind of took me by surprise where I felt that one point when my gallbladder issues were at their worst, like I was literally having a heart attack. Um, my heart was racing, palpitations, pain, chest pain, all of that. Um, and it was because of, I was told by doctors to stop eating fats. My brain told me to eat more fats and it was eating the more fat that actually helped me pass that that point because I feel like if I had gone the, the uh, decrease fat way I probably would have lost my gallbladder which I feel like is extremely important to me um, so I was on this quest to keep it so I started you know eating more animal fats um, more grass-fed meats and things like that um, so 
I would say my longest stretch was maybe about, you know, a couple years or so, two or three years at, uh, of, of not cheating. I'll say that. And um, I felt like there was some tremendous benefits. I was also lifting weights at that point too. Like I had a power rack in my house and I was doing um, this strong lift five by five type program where I was lifting a lot of heavy weights. And um, that was possible, I think, because I was eating carnivore. So um, now I Wow, you like have a lot of years under your belt <laughs> of, uh, you know, doing carnivore in some form or another. So that's awesome. Yeah, I, I just, uh, I just, I feel like now I'm so I'm focused on it. And I feel like I can be because one, I, another thing that was difficult before is my work schedule. Um, I worked in IT for over 20 years. And it, it just got to a point where I was just uh, working way more than 40 hours a week, that whole thing. And now that I'm living in a van, um, I could do what my time is my time. And so I feel like I can definitely focus more on taking care of myself. And um, so I can do the carnivore a little bit more easily. Um, I have all this outdoor natural space I can cook in. I don't, I don't have to be in a rush. I don't have to, you know, worry about thawing out food and, and waiting for it because I got to work or something like that. So I feel like it's really freed me to, to have the time to take better care of myself. And to it's eat funny. Food. I, I feel like people would think the opposite that when you're on the road, like you don't have a lot of control over your food, it might be harder to, to eat right and eat healthy, but it sounds like, you know, you're saying like, you really do your best when you're on the road and you really can control a lot of things. So right. yeah, mm -hmm. it's definitely, it's definitely that way. I definitely feel like I have complete control over my eating out here because like I can, um, one of the things that we all struggle with all the nomads struggle with, or most of us is travel days. Like today would be considered a travel day because I had to get up this morning and drive from where I was to a acquire a location so that we could do this wonderful interview so so it was um so this would be considered I was gonna move anyway so it wasn't really just because of this it's just because the temperature where I was was too hot as well so I was gonna already move today but travel days are cheat days for a lot of people who are trying to control their diet while they're out on the road um because really yeah yeah because like you figure okay I'm gonna get up you you know you might be driving like anywhere from two to ten hours that day so you know who's gonna stop and, and bust out all the camping you know the camp kitchen and stuff like that to cook you know to cook something carnivore um so you know is the tendency to cheat if you're gonna just be driving continuously for 10 hours or eight hours or however long you're gonna drive it, you know it's easier to just go through a drive through and eat eat the crap um so it's it's a struggle and it helps to have things like beef jerky or any type of jerky or things that you can grab and eat uh, on those travel days, uh, for right. sure. That's like critical because otherwise you will cheat. I, I mean, there's no doubt about it or you just be starving to death. So um, that that's something that took me a little while to get hold of. And, and it's still a struggle for me, uh, for sure, uh, on, on travel days to not... Uh, use it as an excuse to go and get something that's not going to be good for me because I feel sick imme immediately uh, right. if I eat something like that. And um, then driving while sick, it's got to really suck. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I just on a sidetrack, because you asked me this and I don't think I um, answered it as far as like facilities and stuff inside the van. Um, for I have a shower tent. Um, hmm. so there's, there's things that you can carry, like on, if you're driving, you can always go to a truck stop. They have nice showers and stuff like that. And some laundromats, which I think is a great idea also have showers. So you can do, you can wash your clothes and take a shower. Wow. Um, yeah, so it's pretty, that's pretty cool. Um, so there's different places that you can go and they're plentiful, at least out West where you can go and get showers and stuff because you think truck drivers need these things too. So a lot right. of us use like truck stops. You can use the gym, but I, I've never used the gym. I just use like a, a truck shop or something like that. But when I'm camped, like I only camp on in forest lands, state trust lands, and Bureau of Land Management land. 
Um, so I have a shower tent. I also have a uh, screen house that has panels I can put on the screens to kind of block out everything. 